It's easy to think of mathematics and biology as two separate subjects without very much in common. Well today, I'm going to look at a mathematical model for the competition between two species. And this is useful, of course, for things like natural selection, where you might have one species that has a mutation, and now you have two species that are competing with each other in a shared environment. And you can ask questions like, what makes one species better at competing compared to another species? For example, one species might spread out more in that environment. Does that make them better at overall out-competing the other species? And also, what sort of factors lead to the extinction of a species? We can model this in a very simple way using a partial differential equation. We'll solve this partial differential equation in Python and we'll use a finite difference method to look at the solutions and we'll examine what conditions make some species better than others in certain environments. Before that, however, uh, I made this Darwin distract, so uh, here it is. I'm about to tell you a little story about a man named Charles Darwin. He seemed like the natural selection for this video. On the origin of Darwin, biology, that's tame. So okay. trip on a boat playing child's games. You've seen beaks before? Here, have some more. Our common ancestor's mug was better looking than yours. Oh. Survival of the fittest? How no wonder you're deceased. But I guess you kind of changed the world, at least. Yo. You got those plants and animals. Now get ready for some math and watch your theory evolve while you stay in the past. So today we have the following packages. As normal, we have NumPy, Matplotlib. We're gonna make some animations. And as always, we're gonna use Numba to solve PDEs efficiently and quickly. So before we look at two species competing with each other, let's look at how a single species will um, distribute itself in space as a function of time. For example, if it's an invasive species, it might come into a forest and suddenly the density increases a lot and there's a lot more of those species there. Or maybe a species becomes extinct and the density of the species there uh, decays. That's what I mean by change with time. So let's uh, figure out our variables here. So rho, rather than considering n, the number of species in a given location, because we're continuous, we have to consider a density. So a high density of deer in a forest is you know, represented by density and not by n equals 300 deer. So rho is the density of the species, right? Uh, there's also going to be x and y. And x and y, remember if we're looking at a bird's eye view of the earth, represent our coordinates there. And it, I have to make a point here that we're considering a very large space. We're not considering a field with little packs of deer or something like that. We're considering like something, you know, where there might be a forest here, or a desert, uh, something, you know, maybe a, a pack of trees, like a big forest of trees, maybe a valley, and then something else. Big, big space here in uh, X and Y. And so um, I'm going to call that a field for this problem, but don't think of it as like a regular field that you know you look at and people are playing soccer on or something. And so the most simple way to model this is with the following PDE that you see here. So d rho dt is saying at any point X, Y, how does the density change with time? So let's start by looking at this first term, right? And I'm gonna focus first on the Laplacian of rho. And what the Laplacian essentially says in a sort of geometric interpretation is you say, how does the density at my point I'm located at compared to the average density around me, right? So you're dealing with like calculus, you're dealing with infinitesimal, you look at a, a singular point, how does the density there compare to the points around me, the average of the points around me? And what the Laplacian returns is it returns the difference between that. It returns the difference between the points around it and you. And so essentially what this says is d rho dt equals this. This is the first term. The Laplacian is the difference of the points around it versus you. If there's more density around you than where you're located, then you're going to grow. And if there's less density around you than where you're located, then you're going to shrink. The difference in rho, d rho dt, with respect to time, will shrink if you're less dense. And so what this has to do is the diffusion of animals, right? Animals move around in their setting. And so like the heat equation, how heat diffuses in a substance, by the way, this is the heat equation, if you ignore these other terms, but the animals will diffuse and places where there's, you know, more density around than that point, the animals will go there. And so D is a constant that represents the diffusion rate. The second term here, alpha is a function of R. Remember R is your position times rho. So it's proportional to the number of the density or the number of animals at that location. 
And what alpha is, is it represents the resources at that location. So again, suppose you have this massive field with various animals located at various parts. And maybe there's some trees at one location or a forest, right? We're dealing with a really big uh, position scale here. So there's a forest at one part and there's a savanna with nothing at the other part. What it says is the forest where the deer can get things to eat. There's more res resources there. So alpha is going to be higher there than before. And so the row DT, the, the change in the population, right? It says that when there are more resources, it's going to change higher. So the higher alpha is, the more you get this and it's proportional to the row itself. So more people and more, more creatures and more resources, and you're going to get a larger change over time. The last term here, uh, minus beta times row squared, that's like a limitation parameter. It says that if you're too dense, right? If there's too many creatures in a location, then they, they're not able to survive because of overpopulation. So if there's a lot of deer in one forest, it, there's gonna be a problem. And so this minus beta times row squared, beta is just a constant, says this is like how good a species is at, um, you know, some species, for example, deer, you put a lot of them in one area, um, they're not gonna be able to compete because they're gonna be competing for resources and stuff. Whereas like, you know, uh, bees or something that live in a hive can have thousands of them living in a very confined space. So beta would be a lot um, smaller for bees. There's less of an effect there. So those are all the constants. Um, also, when you're solving this equation, you need to specify the density at an initial time. So what's the density when you start? What are the resources? And then we're going to solve how are the population gonna move around as a function of time? Um, so there's a little trick you can do with this equation here. And instead of dealing with rho, and you notice we have three parameters, d, alpha, and beta. Well, it turns out we can actually get rid of one of those parameters. So we only have to consider, you know, two parameters here. And what the trick is, is you multiply both sides of the equation by beta. And you'll see that beta rho, or the term beta times rho, will always show up together. So here you have beta rho, beta rho, beta rho, and here beta squared rho squared. And so you set u is equal to beta rho, and you get this equation here. And now we only have to deal with two parameters. And you'll note that beta is just a constant. So u is proportional to rho anyways. So it doesn't matter. We're still looking at the density. It's just off by a proportionality factor, but that doesn't really matter here. We still have our d and alpha. Now I'm gonna be considering this in one dimension, right? It's a, it's a simple model. Um, you just have, you know, X location and animals can be located at various points on that uh, one dimensional line. And I changed the parameters a bit. So I have DU, DT, uh, capital D, I call small d here. Um, now your Laplacian becomes a, just a second derivative. And then you also have this term here, uh, U, and I call alpha R of X, R for resources. Uh, so alpha is the same as R here, U times R of X resources minus U. So this is the equation in one dimension. So it's essentially saying that the population, rather than being in a two dimensional plane, you know, the animals can be either left or to the right, and there are going to be resources. This is a simple model here. So this is for a single species. So this equation up here for a single species, right? Single species of deer moving around a field can be modified for if there's now two competing species on that field. And suppose they move around at different rates, right? One sort of migrates really fast over generations, right? It spreads out more. The other stays more localized. It doesn't spread out as much. Um, and we can write equations down for how the two species evolve with time when they're competing with each other, right? And so you can modify this equation here. And now I have U as my first species and V as my second species. And so everything is the same in these equations. I have D1 and D2 for the two different diffusion rates of these uh, two species. And I still have this U times R of X minus U, but I also have this minus A times V here. So that takes into account that the species isn't only competing with itself anymore, right? In that area, right? Overpopulation with itself is an issue, but also overpopulation with the fact that if there's too much of the other species living there, it also becomes an issue. And this proportionality factor A is saying the higher A is, the more the problem is when the other species is in there. So this rate will, you know, get the change in U will be smaller, the higher A is. And that says that you introduce A times V here and B times U here. 
And so the one that has the smaller factor of A and B is better at outcompeting that other species, right? If B is 0.1 and A is 10, it says that the change in U is really bad when the two species live together. Whereas the second one, if B is really small, it says, well, if the other species is here, it can still survive better, even in that overpopulated situation. And so there will be initial conditions on this big field. Um, there'll be U of X, zero is F of X. That's the initial distribution of the one. Uh, remember, it's, it's a one dimensional um, thing here. So there's the initial distribution of species one and the initial distribution of species two. So that was a long summary of the equations here. Now there's a question and the question is what makes one species better at outcompeting another species, right? And so things to keep in mind, A and B, I already described A and B, how if, uh, for example, A is smaller than B, then species U is better at surviving in crowded conditions than species V. A D1 and D2, and this is a question you might ask, like, is it better to diffuse out more across generations or is it better to stay localized in one area? And of course, also the initial conditions F of X and, D of, and G of X. Uh, so we'll be using the finite difference method in this video to solve these PDEs. And so here I have, um, I'll show a plot up here and you have a bunch of, instead of dealing with it continuously, you split it up into a grid in X and discrete times as well. And so I is the position index and M is the time index. And it says at position I at time N plus one, it's equal to the following here. So uh, this isn't a, like to the power of M plus one, this is the M plus first index in time. So we're gonna try out different configurations of these parameters and see what species is better at surviving, what makes a species better at surviving. And we'll deal with a few obvious ones first. So we'll solve for the fall over the following times, a zero to 140, 200,000 times. Uh, you know what the lin space does in Python, of course. It will just create many times like this, going all the way up from zero to 140. Uh, do the same thing for position. This is our grid. Uh, this is gonna represent the densities. I call it P here, that's really U and V. So P1 is U and P2 is V here. And I started up with uh, just all zeros. Our resources is going to be a Gaussian curve at the centered at zero. And I'll plot this in a second. And I'll also plot the initial condition. So here I say my initial uh, U, this is where one species starts and where the other species starts are also Gaussians. I say that they diffuse at the same rate and they're both um, uh, equal competing with each other. In other words, they're both affected by overpopulation to the same extent. So I can do this and let's uh, plot some stuff here. So if I plot um, X, R, this is what my resources look like. And I'll plot that in green. So essentially here's the location, it's bounded. They can't leave the area, right? That's another thing about this problem. You can't diffuse out of this boundary. It's a fixed closed boundary. Um, and so now let's look at where the two species start. So let me remove this. And so I'm going to take, okay, this is my, at time zero, this is species one. And at time zero, this is species two. And as you can see, um, species one is here, species two is here. And I don't know if you can tell, but species two is a little bit farther away from the resources than species one. So you have, there's little resources here and here. But of course, the, the species is going to spread out and find the resources. And of course, the hypothesis is the species that starts closer to the green is going to diffuse there quicker and probably outcompete the other one. Um, this is dt over dx squared. This has to be small enough so that you're not, um, you don't run into issues with solving the partial differential equation. And uh, now we apply the finite difference method in this function here. So let's think about what's happening here. And again, go through my past videos to sort of see how these PDEs are solved. It takes in the densities here, the initial densities of the two uh, populations. And it also takes in the resources, right? And it's going to solve for the density of the species at all times. So we need a double for loop uh, over time and space like this. And we're just going to apply this algorithm over and over. 
and we're gonna do it for each value of i, and then we're gonna loop over for all values of time as well. And then we get a snapshot of our density of our species at each point in time. And so because we have what are called insulated boundary conditions, uh, we need to be careful about how we evaluate this second derivative here, right? This is on the inside, but if I'm at the edge, right, and I want to find i, and I'm considering i plus 1, well, I can't go outside the edge. And so there's special boundary conditions that I need to take into account here, which I do in these if statements. Um, and so this is uh, the second derivative for population 1 and the second derivative for population 2. And this says if I'm at the left of the boundary, if I'm at the right of the boundary, or if I'm in the middle. So if I'm in the middle, I get the regular uh, thing here corresponding to this here. But otherwise, because it's insulated, I would either have to take uh, 2 times i plus 1, or in the other case where I'm at the uh, right-hand side, 2 times i minus 1. And I encourage you to look into this if you're curious about these boundary conditions. And I also encourage you to sort of sit and look at the equation that I provided and also meditate on how this function works, right? You're not going to understand it really fast. You have to kind of sit and digest the code a little bit here. And of course it will return, then it returns like a photo album of the population density at every point in time. So I have my function here and I can solve for the two populations and then I can enter in any point I I want. I is just the index of the array and it will produce a plot here. So here's of course the first frame, species one, species two, they did diffuse at the same rate and the resources are in the middle. And so I can increment a little bit. Remember I have 200,000 of these and you see that they start to shrink because they have no resources, but they're also diffusing into the resources a little. So these guys are gonna start to grow because they have resources here. Run again. And you can see that uh, the blue is starting to grow faster than the orange. That's because the blue started closer to the green than the orange did. In other words, the one species started closer to the resources than the other. So, of course, it's starting to grow faster than the other species. And, of course, I can continue to do this and you'll see the evolution. And you see that blue got there first and now blue has one. And there's still some orange here. It's actually not completely eliminated the other species, but it has done very well. And it will continue like this for most of the frames. And so I can make an animation of this. Okay, so the animation is finished and we can watch it here. So it is a GIF. And so you can actually see blue gets to the resources first. And then you sort of reach this equilibrium of the two species here. Okay, so we've seen that the population that starts closer to the resources is going to outcompete the other. And there's going to be more of that species in the end. It doesn't actually eliminate the other species, but they're sort of reach an equilibrium where there's more than one of the than the other, which is what you see here. The density is higher, but orange hasn't gone to zero yet. Now, let's look at an interesting configuration. Configuration two. And so here, Everything is equal. They actually start equal distances away from the resources, but I give population two a faster diffusion rate than population one. So here's where you might have the following hypothesis. You say, okay, they're equal distance away from the resources. The one that diffuses faster is gonna get there first and it's gonna outcompete the other, right? Okay, well, let's, let's watch what happened. And this is really interesting, by the way, for what happens here. So change the configuration two. We can rerun all the code. I don't want to spoil it, so I'm just going to start at the initial frame. And you can see that they start at the same distance from the resources. Population two, which is orange, it's going to diffuse faster into the resources. So you would think that it would outcompete species one, right? And so we'll watch what happens. Okay, so the animation is finished. Let's take a watch. Okay, so orange diffuses faster. It gets to the resources. Okay, the one that is uh, got to the resources first really looks like it's taken over here. Blue almost looks like it's extinct. It did not get to the resources fast enough. But watch this. You give blue enough time and it starts growing in here. You might not see it now. You might not see it. But blue is starting to increase, increase, increase. And look at that. Blue, who diffuses less, who got to the resources second is now starting to outcompete orange 
and take its place in the area of resources. So that's a very interesting one. Even though Orange got there first and found the resources, Slow and Steady wins the race here. And the population that has the lower diffusion rate actually ends up winning in the end. Okay, so configuration three that I show here is uh, pretty simple. I just wanna show something that's not too complicated. Again, they're gonna start equal distances from the resources, but one is going to have a selective advantage over the other. Um, with A, with B being smaller than A, and if you look up to these equations here, small b means that population 2 is less affected by overpopulation uh, than population u here, when their two species are crowded together. So I can run, uh, change the configuration to configuration 3, and we can once again rerun the code. And if I look at the initial condition, sure enough, they're starting from the same place, they have the same diffusion rate, but now one is less affected by overpopulation. And so we'll make an animation. Okay, so the animation is finished and we can watch this here. So remember that orange is less affected by overpopulation. And because it's less affected, it will grow here and it will dominate the resources. And actually because it's less affected by population, blue will eventually become not only outcompeted, but extinct in this situation. If you give it enough time to converge. It takes a long time, of course, this is a convergence property. Okay, so now we'll look at one final configuration with the two species. Uh, the diffusion rates are a lot faster than configuration two, um, but you'll note that A and B are different. So what happens here is population one diffuses a lot slower than the other one. We've already shown that that's better, uh, but population two is less affected by overpopulation. So we're gonna see, does the slower diffusion rate, right, that's better for population one, but less being affected by overpopulation is better for population two, so they each have their own strength. The question is what's gonna win here? So uh, we can run all this code and create another animation. Okay, so the animation is finished. We can take a look at this. Okay, so remember that blue had the slower diffusion rate, but even though orange is less affected by overpopulation than blue is, blue is the winner here again. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. I went a little bit into the code in this video and uh, how this works, but this would be the most simple model for two populations competing with each other for resources and having to deal with overpopulation as well. If you like this video, remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.